please welcome Julian Fogels and uh, give him a warm applause. Thanks. So, Sorry, uh, I made a terrible mistake. 8011. Der Talk wird nicht auf 8012, sondern auf der 8011 uh, zu hören sein. Please. Thanks have fun. for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I'm very excited, actually. A little bit, maybe a little bit too excited, so please bear with me. <laughs> uh, today, I talk about the evolution and design of digital musical instruments. Uh, the talk will be not so technical, but like my, the purpose is actually more to inspire makers to like pursue this field and join me in my passions for for these instruments because they are amazing. So, just read uh, re briefly about me. Um, I'm Julian. I'm uh, I'm from southern Germany. I studied in what you just said uh, in Quebec, music technology, and right now I'm uh, running a little. Uh, music tech startup company in Hong Kong as the CTO, and I'm a drummer. So first of all, where do DMIs, digital music instruments, come from? They actually have a really long history, despite what you might, might think. Um, so, you know, acoustical music, musical instruments like the piano, the violin, they're all like, they're centuries old and they were refined and refined and they're really very good instruments. Uh, but that the verge of the 20th century, people discovered new technologies and, and they wanted to utilize this in the context of music. So already 1897, there was uh, the Telharmonium built, which was um, kind of like a huge organ kind of thing. And it, the, the idea was there was no radio, so they wanted to distribute the sound to the living rooms of the people. So it was like a huge cable thing that weighed like 200 ton to tons, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and um, that was the first one that someone spent his whole fortune on. Then um, the first, what we call open air controller, because you don't touch anything, is, is, um, from, is built by Leo, Leon Teremin, or Lev Teremin, his real name. And, Excuse me, um, I think there's no sound coming out of my laptop. So this is, this is how a Teremin sounds. You might know it from the X-Files, for example, that were used, that were, was it used? Then, in uh, 1928, Monsieur Martineau built the Onde Martineau, uh, which had like a very unique control uh, you see this ring, which was like on a slide, so you could like ha ha have like super nice uh, tremolo effects and a very slight uh, control of of dynamics. So um, this sounds like like this, and uh, and Radiohead actually also rebuilt one recently and uh, and use it in a lot of lot of songs because it's really an amazing instrument. So all those uh, early music instruments, they had. Uh, they were, they enjoyed a lot of approval by the society just because it was a very futurist time. Uh, same also is, um, is valid for the Tritonium, which is a predecessor of the synthesizer and uh, had like a, an, um, a resist, resisting wire where you play. It sounds like this. Then later the Hammond organ was invented. Uh, it's not, doesn't really classify as an electronic instrument because it's actually electromechanic, but this is such important invention that I just wanted to show it because it was uh, very beneficial to the whole field. Then later the electronic sackbutt uh, was invented, which was the first instrument where you, which was like a synthesizer that was voltage controlled and had like extreme precise control or accurate control of, uh, of timbral properties of the sound. It sounds like this. Then a new, new age um, commences, which is uh, computer music. So in 57, Max Matthews at Bell Labs uh, used the, the, the telephone uh, network and the computers that they, the facilities that they had to actually build the first computer program for sound synthesis. And um, at the same time, also the Mark II from RCA was, uh, was um, 
published or uh, uh, invented. So um, it sounds like this is one of the, the first program synthesizers. Then a uh, very popular uh, Moog, uh, invented the Moog and the Mini Moog, uh, which are uh, until today uh, super famous for their fat sound and were very like a huge commercial success. Then another new age, uh, everything became digitalized. So the Fairlight was one of the first digital uh, digital synthesizers, and the MIDI MIDI was invented or specified as a uh, you know, as a specification. So you could actually now connect synthesizers to in, to, to another to um, to use. Actually, this is very important because now the interface was separated from the sound source. Now you could just send control signals, which is very important. We'll be, we'll be seeing in, in a minute. And uh, also, 1980 was like the first like. Popular, um, let's say, unconventional controllers that like get away from the whole keyboard thing, and a lot of at the same time a lot of like research institutions institutions were founded in like Stein, uh, IEM, IRCAM, and and so on. Uh, the uh, the CMI file at CMI sounds like this. Or did like digital synthesizer? Then, um, still in the 80s, uh, of course, as you probably all know, this sound uh, is the popularization and, uh, of synthesizers, um, which were so commonly used until today in, in popular music. And uh, one of the cornerstones of that was the DX7 from Yamaha, which was the first one that used FM digital synthesis. And also in the mid 80s, uh, Miller Pocket uh, invented Max. Max is uh, until today used as some, somehow like the most important or one of the most important um, like computer music uh, softwares for composing, or but also sound synthesis and, and mappings. Uh, so it's like a visual programming um, IDE. And uh, out of this, also Pure Data was uh, coming out of this same invention. Or? And then uh, controllers get more and more uh, unconventional. So, for example, Max Matthews, the same guy who invented computer music at Bell, uh, he uh, developed the radio baton. Then uh, there, there were controllers with like more advanced sensors. And uh, for example, there's also the, the lightning, which used infrared and uh, sounds very different. Like now it's more like a digitalized analog, um, like conventional instrument, but very different playing techniques. And in 2002, the NIME conference was, f uh, had, was the first NIME conference, which is until today the biggest conference for uh, new musical interfaces and digital music instruments. And uh, between 2002 and 2008, there were uh, 266 uh, musical instruments presented. And I don't have data for 2002 to uh, 2008 until today, but uh, there you can see how many new inventions there are and how popular this field became. In the future, I think it will be even like uh, we have uh, an increasing number uh, of new inventions and great new instruments because we have more accessible uh, sensors and materials and, uh, and also I think the community of musicians which tend to be a little conservative and, and uh, um, not very keen on trying new uh, instruments, they, will, they kind of open up a little bit. You see more and more like uh, new instruments being played by musicians, professional musicians. Uh, yeah, but at the same time, so um, I reviewed a lot of patterns in this uh, in this field, and unfortunately, there are so many inventions, but like they're not really known. They're not really a big commercial or even like just normal like public success. And um, that's also why I'm giving my talk. I want to inspire more people to build them in a way that they, they don't like stay in a garage. So now, to the design part. Um, a DMI is composed of three parts. So you got the interface where the musician interacts with the, with the instrument, but um, 
this distinction is very important that you have the interface that is separated from the sound source. So the sound source is normally a computer. And the mapping maps this input parameters to the output parameters, so synthesis parameters. So that's pretty amazing because now DMIs are flexible. You can customize them. You have completely, it's completely open. You can do whatever sound you want with them and you can tweak the controls beyond what is just a physical object that is like, well, you have to rebuild a new one. You can just like, it's so fast to, to, to get to a nice music expression. So in my, in my personal research and work, I focus more on the gestural control side, so less on the synthesis side. Um, because I, found, I find that controllers are really very interesting. Uh, we use them all the time. For example, you know, you, you use a keyboard to type. It's specifically per, uh, um, designed for this purpose. You use a gamepad to, to game. But sometimes you even use a keyboard for gaming or a gamepad because you have to write on your, something on, on your uh, console. And uh, so they see that they, they have to be really, for one purpose, designed for this thing. And that's for every instrument, it's the same. Um, and there are different types of them. So I find this very interesting the, to classify them like this. So uh, you have augmented music instruments, you have instrument-like DMIs, instrument-inspired DMIs, and alternate controllers. For example, here. Augmented music instruments are real instruments where you stick a bunch of sensors to them, for example, uh, touch buttons or uh, FSRs or whatever you can imagine, actually. Uh, here you see also, like in Neil uh, Farwell's adapted trombone, is like a distance measurement with ultrasound. And all those things um, are then uh, mapped to synthesis that runs like in parallel to the actual instrument's output. Then uh, a more commercial type of this, of instruments are uh, instrument light controllers because they kind of they try to um, emulate the um, the musician's gesture of a known instrument uh, perfectly. So like imagine like your trumpet is uh, trumpeter trumpeter I don't know uh, you get this you get this uh, instrument and you can immediately use it because it has the exact same gestures but the sound can be different. Then there are instrument inspired controllers where it's a little a little f uh, further from the, from the instrument light controllers, you can still use some of your gestures that you were used to as a musician, but it makes more out of, out of them. Like you can, for example, here's the uh, pretty new instrument, the Seaboard Grand, the, the one with the wobbly um, texture there. And um, there, it's like a piano, but you can press down and it has like a subtle control of, of vibrato and, and you can slide pitch. Um, yeah. There's also the Eigen Harp, which is uh, on the top uh, uh, right, and uh, the Instrument One, which was a recent, very uh, new instruments. And an alternate controller has nothing to do actually with any um, music instrument that was there before. For example, there's the uh, the audio cubes, which are actually cubes that know about each other's uh, position and uh, and rotation. So you can actually Imagine like it's not it's not like the, like the conventional music instruments. It's more like for um, sequential control of, of things, or like it's called an ambient instrument. Then, uh, for example, Perry Cook here. Uh, he's a famous uh, instrument maker. So he um, he used everyday objects like like a mug or a shoe, because he said. People can relate to that so immediately that they just pick it up and they, they know how to, how to hold it. And if I place the sensors at the right spot, they know how to use it way faster than if it's just an arbitrary object. Um, uh, there's also the alpha sphere, which is also a very interesting shape and light. And also, like the, uh, for example, a graphic tablet, I like this, uh, this as, a, as an example because it has pretty accurate sensors and pretty it's also an everyday object. Like you, you know how you, to use a pen, and you're very skilled already at it. So why not use it as an instrument? Then uh, this is also part of the alternate controllers, collaborative controllers. Um, at the right, you see the two car, where two, two people play at the same time, and the react, ta react table on the left uh, from Siaji Yoga uh, Yoda. Um, who, uh, where it's a tangible interface, you interact with the digital 
um, digital information on the physical space. It's all projected from the bottom and it reads whatever objects you place on them and it, you can rotate them and change the distances between them and make music like this. Then there are body controllers, um, which are very popular at the moment too. Um, it's just, well, you want to use your body gestures, whatever gesture you want. To, like, you want to just um, acquire all data about your hand movement or body movement. So, um, for example, there's uh, Michel Weiswitz. Uh, he has, it's called The Hands, it's a very uh, famous one. And Imogen He, for example, she he, he developed the gloves in the middle. Uh, on the right, there's Onyx Ashanti with beat jazz. And on the bottom is Marco Donorama, who uh, uses bio signals um, from his arms directly to make music. And also, open air controllers. Open air controllers are you don't have any, well, any, uh, any feedback, anything. It's just like your hands, you don't have any sensors. So they, mo they use uh, always uh, computer vision for this. And yeah, and uh, for this, in the future, we can all imagine where the, where the journey goes to uh, augmented reality and, uh, and to totally immersive systems. So, um, to the interface part. How do you design an interface? How, how do you start doing this? So, for me, what I like to do is I think about gesture, about how does a musician move, what movements could you, could you uh, do, or what can you imagine, what co would correspond well to dynamics, so to volume, and uh, to pitch. Would it be a discrete, would it be a sliding pitch, uh, and what corresponds to timbre of the music? So timbre, I'm uh, not sure if everyone knows the, the term, it's about uh, if, the, if the sound is more sharp or more mellow or, you know. Then um, uh, to, to get an, an idea of what you could do, you sh the first thing you do is you, you observe musicians, how they play. So then you know, the, because that's where, where they're coming from. And, and uh, there are a lot of interesting gestures in all musical instruments. For me, for, me, for example, I... I did a study where I studied the gestures of harmonica players. And they have a lot of interesting gestures like the hand cupping gesture or just how they move the instrument. And uh, they have different techniques with the fingers and also like angles. And so I did a whole motion capture study, which is amazing to get lots of data and numerical data. They are optical ones, they are exoskeleton ones and, um, and also magnetic field motion capture. Uh, the problem is that they're super expensive and you only find them in like research facilities. Um, so what would be better for the, for the DIY maker is you use videos. You just look at musicians perform and use open source software. My favorite is uh, Elan. And you just annotate the, the, the gestures that they make. Like you say, okay, um, it's like huge upward movement and, and all these things, you annotate them, and then you also listen to the sound, or you can even analyze the sound and export it um, as, a, as different um, sound properties. Uh, for example, with Sonic, Sonic Visualizer, I, don't, I didn't put it on there, but it's a great software for analyzing sound. And then you compare what, what property of the sound changed when a musician did this, ge this gesture. For example, for, for harmonica, it was like... Uh, many people leaned backwards when they were, uh, when they were more expressive and more high-pitched. And, and those things, you can, you can use them. They already used it to, those, to those gestures. Uh, annotation software works pretty, is pretty simple. You're just like, you have different videos, for example, on what I labeled with three there, is, uh, it's just some, some data, some spectral centroid, I think, and, and then you just say, okay, what happens? And then you look at the, at the graph and you know what sound property is affected, and then you can, well, you can, you can use that in your considerations what gesture you want to use. For the acquisition of gesture, of course, I, I could elaborate on that, but I wanted to keep it short. You use all kinds of different sensors. They have to be suitable to what you want to acquire. For example, FSRs for force sliders and LVDTs for uh, uh, displacement. Infrared and ultrasound, you can use them at, as displacement or, or general, like uh, um, if there's a hand here or there or whatever. Um, so be creative. and. Uh, if you want to look more into sensors and stuff, you can also use sensor fusion to get even more data out of two different, like if you have two sensors and you use sensor fusion, you can get more information 
out of it than you could use uh, that you, you can get from with either one of them or both together. Now, the second part is the mapping part, which is kind of like distinguishing a bad instrument from a good instrument. Because you can have very easy mappings, like one-to-one, -one, like, you know, you do this, pitch goes up, pitch goes down, or uh, volume up, volume down, whatever. And, uh, but it turns out um, a lot of good musical instruments are not that simple, because that, of course, you understand it really quickly, but it gets boring, and then your instrument has some kind of like a toy-like character, which you want to avoid. You want to make it a little bit more complex because you want people to be able to master your instrument, and it shouldn't be easy. Um, so uh, a many-to-many -many mapping, for example, is you use multiple input variables, and you map them to multiple synthesis parameters. parameters. So a musician doesn't, like, you can try out some stuff, but you wouldn't really get what's really going on because you have to change all of them at the same time to get to a result. That inspires a more, like, holistic kind of um, use of the instrument. So uh, the musician more, more or less um, just learns gestures instead of learns parameters, which is like a totally different um, paradigm of, of, of using instruments. Interesting mapping ideas are also, you can use machine learning to classify a gesture. For example, you could record a gesture like, like this with any sensor you, you attach, or just using the instrument you record a gesture. And then you use a, a classification algorithm to, um, to say, do you have three or four gestures? And you say, which one was the closest? And then you uh, trigger an action based on that. Um, you can also use in, indirect data. Let's say you have, um, well, you have a slider. And you, you can, of course, read where it is. But also, you should think about, can I use the velocity of someone um, sliding the slider and map it to another synthesis parameter? Then also you can user-defined mappings, although you should be careful with this because um, it's, it's more flexible, but then you lose kind of the face of your instrument because it, well, it was def um, designed to sound like this or not work like this. And if you make it totally um, random, then it's random. Then so you have a, a lot of cool open source mapping tools. Um, like LibMapper, where you can even map um, over a whole network uh, using OSC, Open Sound Control. And uh, also other interesting toolboxes from uh, IRCAM, where you can, this, this is where you can do the, the whole gesture um, recording and, and classification. Then uh, the sound synthesis. As I said, I'm, I'm not talking so much about this, but there's several different techniques, additive, subject, su subjective, FM, uh, you have cool physical modeling stuff where you actually emulate a real opt, um, instrument just digitally, and you have a lot of uh, great open source software to, to, to build your own. Then feedback. So um, if you're playing a violin, then you, um, you, you bow it, and the whole body actually vibrates. Many musicians don't even recognize it, but it's very important for them when they're learning an instrument that they get the vibrations on their body. Um, if, you, if you would take that away, it would be way harder for them to learn the instrument. It, it gives them a feedback about the state of the instrument. The problem is now, with digital music instruments, this doesn't occur naturally. So you would have to add actuators to the instrument to give some kind of primary feedback to the, uh, to the performer. You can do that with, uh, with vibration motors, servos, whatever uh, can convey uh, information to haptics visual or, or even uh, if there's a special sound that occurs. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I want to inspire the home making community to, to, uh, to do, to build uh, digital, digital music instruments. I think it's a very exciting field. It's complex enough so you can spend your whole life in this field and uh, you have a lot of tools at your hand. Uh, everything is getting cheaper. The sensors are now really, like, those instruments that they saw from the 80s, they were super expensive. Now, this is really doable. Um, then you have all those uh, embedded systems like Raspberry Pi, Bigabone Black, etc., etc., where you can do now a synthesis on this space, on a credit card space, which, was, which is amazing for most people that, that built those uh, other instruments uh, 30 years ago. So the challenges, though, are 
uh, are there. So, for example, at the NIME conference, there are so many instruments, but a lot of them sound kind of the same because they have a crazy interface, they map it somehow, and then, then it's, it's just noise. It's just like... Dee -doo 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 -doo. And nobody can really relate to this other than people that really like noise music. And often, in my eyes, it's also an excuse, like, oh yeah, I do noise music, music so I don't have to care about the sound. Uh, so don't make these mistakes. And, uh, and also, don't be the only one who masters your instrument. That's one, something that I did in the past. I, I built instruments. And I try to be good at it, but actually what I should have done is give it out, make two or three of them, and give them to musicians, and have their feedback immediately. And make, that's also why you have to make the setup easy. For example, an audience doesn't like it if, so, if everything is cabled and you're actually more on your Mac than on your instrument. Uh, so make it, that's also like, you know, the coolest thing is to have it like an embedded system, a box, like an instrument, what people are used to, because it's very important that you that a musician can talk to the audience, that the audience sees um, like big gestures and, and can relate to what the music, musician is doing. If, if they don't even see what you're doing on the keyboard, then they won't find the, uh, the performance interesting. It's, only, it's not only about the music, it's also about the visuals. Uh, a nice quote that I wanted to bring is this. Um, so this is Western writer talking about DMIs and what the perfect DMI would look like. And it has a low entry fee. Everyone can pick it up and immediately make sound with it without knowing much about it. But it has no ceiling on virtuosity. It means that anyone who wants to master it has to spend 10,000 hours to be perfect at it, just like with the violin or the piano. Here are some, some of my own creations. Uh, uh, on the left top is uh, what I call Philumis. It's a rubber cord on a sound body and then a joystick on the top so you can. Uh, plug the string and then mod uh, like m modulate the sound in, in, in two dimensions or even circular one. Then the Lura box is a device where you press record and then use it as a tape, um, a tape player, and, and you can t uh, use your, play your recording back and forth, and then you can destroy it with uh, effects. And you destroy it every t every loop. You destroy it and destroy it until it's noise. <laughs> so expect exactly what you shouldn't do. <laughs> it's just that. And um, so in the middle, this little thing is, the f is my first like, commercial object. It's not really an instrument, it's an, a music accessory. It's a feedback device. So exp exactly for haptic feedback, you can use it f as a metronome or etc. We're producing this now in, in China too. Um, yeah, so just a short demonstration of one of those. This is pretty freaky. <laughs> But it was very, very exper experimental. And here is uh, another one that, um, that is this one, an electronic harmonica.
Okay, I think um, I just concluded like this. Uh, Thank you. Wow. Hi, that's awesome. What do you do? We have, basically, we are, we don't have any time anymore. We are three minutes late, but we are, okay. it's the last talk before the, the, the lunch break. So we have some time for, for Q&A. If there are some questions, please. There are the two microphones. Ask your questions. Um, Hi. <laughs> May you play again? <laughs> May you play again your music? I think it's um, better than asking, uh, uh, answering questions. I, uh, I thought my talk, I, I knew my talk would last like a little bit more than a half hour, so I didn't, I didn't want to do this as well. It, I, can, I can set it up in 10 minutes and it's ready, or you can come to the Void Village and then really try it out yourself later if you want. So. Um, yeah. <laughs> Please. Um, did you ever try the brain waves as a source of uh, sound? Yes, uh, actually that's that's right. I did, I left it out, but there is uh, there was who was his name? There was a famous musician and developer that uh, used this brain wave to to make music, uh, with like huge helmet and stuff. Although um, I think it was very difficult to because it's very noisy to actually think about music and then have it be music. I think we're still a little bit away from this stage, but, but there are people working on this, yes. I think even at the sea base, as I heard. I was thinking about something more earthly, like, uh, uh, I don't know, moving your arm and uh, the brain uh, light, lighting up in some zones. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you try that? Uh, well, if you move your arm, you can also just measure the EMG signal that comes directly from your arm. And uh, for example, there was a nice project in uh, in Montreal where uh, there was one girl, Erin Erin uh, Guy, who uh, she she asked method actors to to have like the arm pierced and like with a syringe in the arm, which is very painful. But she got the best signal out of the arm, and then she asked them to act emotions and translated those emotions into music that were ma was made by robots. So you can do a lot of stuff with EMG signals and... <laughs> Thanks. Someone else? Um, Go ahead. Yeah, just a very meta question. Um, <laughs> what instruments do you have with you, like in the village? Like, what can you try out there? Or um, uh, The only one that's really set up is this one the electronic harmonica. The other one, if someone is interested, this is also like uh, the whole uh, instruction on how to build this is on my website, so we can actually make it work. It's not working right now, but, <laughs> but we, can, we can make it work in a, in a couple of hours, I guess. Okay, thanks. Okay, someone else? Good. Thank you, Julian, for Thank your you. very interesting talk.